glad you're all here. I seem to have this really tight today. Um, this is the 12th Sunday after uh, Pentecost, um, which makes it uh, proper 16 in our, that's what tells us what readings we have. Um, we're on page 355 in the prayer book. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Let's say this together. Almighty God, to you who all the hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and, and peace to his people on earth. Lord our God, heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High. Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Grant, O most merciful God, that your church, being gathered together in unity by your Holy Spirit, may show forth your power among all the peoples to the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them or they will increase and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that as the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites, the Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Sipara and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and it became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, they gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every boy that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. 
Now, a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child and nurse it for me and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and she took him as her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. The word of the Lord. Thank you to God. Psalm is Psalm 124, which is on page like 70. Let's see. Seventy-three, I think. Anyway, Psalm 24. We all do. Um, 24 or 124 on 124. 124. Um, Okay, I'll do today asterisk. Or maybe why don't you do today asterisk? Okay. If the Lord had not been on our side, let Israel, Israel now, now say. say. If the Lord had not been on our side, when enemies, enemies rose up against us, us, they would have swallowed us up alive in their in fierce the anger towards us. us. Then would the waters have overwhelmed us and the torrent run over us. us. Then would the raging waters have gone right over us. Blessed be the Lord. He has, he has not given us over to the authority of our teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowler. The, the snare, snare is broken and we have escaped. escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the, the maker of heaven and earth. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be, mm, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministry, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, 
Some say John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not uh, revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the, the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the, uh, the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Creator, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, well. Um, well, there's a, another embarrassment of riches in the readings for today. The, uh, I haven't really said much about Romans, which has been going very systematically through um, getting to one of the great points, which was today's reading. Um, uh, it's the uh, a little out of balance, I think. The fan. Anyway, um, yeah, that's, I think it's a bit old. Um, I, you know, this, usually when I think about this, uh, who do people say that I am and who do you say that I am, I've always thought of that in a kind of personal way. Um, it, it's to the individual where we uh, think about who Jesus is to us. And, um, but I realized as I was thinking about this that, um, the church went through this process, this very process of deciding who they thought Jesus was. Um, and uh, of course, when you're doing it on sort of an institution-wide um, process, it, it, it's quite different than it is for an individual, and yet it is very analogous to what we as individuals go through because we, you know, we weigh both sides of most things that we do when we're making a choice. And the same is true for who we say Jesus is. Um, and the church had to decide who they thought Jesus is. And, uh, and they did it in the most uh, dramatic fashion. Um, when Constantine made the, the Christian church the church of the empire, uh, which was in the early part of the fourth century, the 300s, um, he inherited a church that was incredibly varied. Um, and they had everything from orthodox all the way to sort of, uh, well, off the chart kind of extreme groups. Um, Gnosticism was a big deal in those days, and Gnosticism was a, was a mystical um, response to Jesus. So, um, and I think Constantine realized that he couldn't govern with a mystical response. He needed something a little more concrete. And so he called, the, or he had the church call a council, the Council of Nicaea, which our creed after the the sermon today is comes right from that uh, from that council, and they were arguing with, wrestling with um, uh, 
really who Jesus was. Now they had this incredible person that came into the midst of them and they, he did miracles and he taught and he, um, and he was resurrected and the, it was all of this incredible stuff, but they had to decide who is he? Really? Who is he? And uh, uh, naturally, like everything in human life, it sort of fell into two camps. Um, and one camp was led by a guy named Arius. They became known as the Arians. Um, and I know I've told that story of uh, St. Nicholas, uh, who is, uh, among other things, uh, besides being the forebear of Santa Claus, is the... Uh, is also the patron of boxers because at the Nicene uh, Council, when Arius was speaking, he went up and slammed him in the jaw and broke it so that Arius couldn't speak anymore. Um, and apparently Arius was incredibly uh, um, mellifluous and uh, very persuasive. And it looked like he was perhaps, uh, you know, taking the day, and uh, St. Nicholas took that away from him. I suspect that he was St. Nicholas, at least partly for that reason. Um, um, as I say, he's the forebear of, the, of our Santa Claus, but he was also the patron for boxers. But Arius was a big deal. And to be quite honest, uh, in terms of numbers of people, Arianism was much more popular than was orthodoxy. Um, the proponents of orthodoxy had been um, Athanasius, and um, um, whose creed is in the historical documents, and sometimes I, I, I think you ought to go look at it uh, and be very glad that we don't have to, to recite that particular creed every Sunday because it's... Uh, it's like a creed written by several lawyers. It is very long and very detailed. Um, Athanasius was Bishop of Alexandria. He was um, ejected from that uh, see uh, four times by Arians. So there was a lot of bitterness between the Arians and the uh, Orthodox party. The Orthodox party said, that Jesus was divine and that he was part of the Godhead. And so the whole idea of the Trinity was to say this is how he was part of the Godhead. Um, Arius, on the other hand, was following a really Jewish tradition because um, Jews have all of these great people like Moses, um, like Elijah, uh, like Jeremiah, um, all of these great people, but they were people. Um, because um, idolatry was such a big battle for the, um, for the Jews, they, uh, they wanted to make sure they didn't make idols out of their great human beings. Of course, they lived in the Roman Empire, and the Roman Empire... Uh, made a, uh, a sort of cottage industry of making people into divine. So, so Augustus, when he died, then became the divine Augustus. And even nasty ones like Caligula and, uh, um, and Nero, who fiddled while Rome burned, were both made divine. So there was that process that divination process going on in the empire. Um, but the Arians didn't want that. They thought Jesus was a great man. Now, to be clear and to be honest about what Peter said, he said, you are the Mashiach Yahweh. You are the Messiah of God. Um, now, that was not a divine being. That was, David was the Mashiach Yahweh. He was the anointed of God. That's what that means. The anointed Messiah is anointed. 
And uh, uh, Peter seems to have meant more than that, but, uh, but in reality, he was expressing it within the tradition of Judaism, and in Judaism, it would have been blasphemy to, to call him divine. Um, so the, the evangelists kind of skate on that particular uh, boundary there. There was clarity among the Orthodox people that Jesus was divine. But he was a great man to the Arians, and those two groups battled it out at the Council of Nicaea, and the Orthodox party won. And they created uh, the, the Nicene Creed, but they, uh, which uh, was an elaboration, really, of the Apostles' Creed. Um, but the elaboration was a very specific elaboration. It was, uh, well, whenever you get the Greeks involved, you've got to deal with philosophy. That just is the deal. They, they uh, uh, Plato and Aristotle made uh, the thinking of Greeks uh, into this very philosophical way of thinking. And so, um, so when they thought about the Trinity, they couldn't go with what Tertullian had said 200 years earlier, um, three and one and one and three. It's a mystery after all, and that probably was enough to say right there. That was certainly enough for the Western church, for the church out of Rome. But the Greek church, that never would have been enough. And so they parsed um, Greek concerns, and they came up with homoousia, which means one substance. Jesus was one substance with the Father and the Spirit. That's what they argued about. And um, they went into great detail uh, about it at the time. Well, the only reason I say this is, uh, you know, I, as a seminarian, you learn this stuff and you know you're never going to be able to preach it. So this is an opportunity for me to, to sort of let you in on a little bit of the historical background of the church. But the reality is, is the church was dealing with the same thing that we deal with. Who do you say that Jesus is? And the church decided to say, to go with the Orthodox party. Now, I wish the Orthodox party had been a little more forgiving, um, but they weren't. They, they took all the Gnostic Gospels and they burned them and they tried to get rid of them. And we've only rediscovered them in the last uh, 100 years. Um, with the Nag Hammadi uh, and the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, we have discovered those things and rediscovered them because I think the contemporary church actually needs them. We need to begin to sort of loosen up the bonds of, of, uh, of orthodoxy, which have been pretty strict, and they were pretty strict for a, a particular reason, and that particular reason was Christianity was part of the government. It governed Rome. And uh, so they needed to make sure they knew who they were. And that's fine. And it's, uh, it's meant that for most of us, most Christian groups, I mean, you go next door to the Baptists, and you'll find that they're basically Orthodox. You go down the street to the, uh, well, not down this street, but the one over in, uh, in Kansas City, and the, you find that the, the Orthodox Church, uh, the Greek Orthodox Church, it's Orthodox, just as it says in its name, but um, very specifically Orthodox. The Episcopal Church is Orthodox. The Roman Church is Orthodox. All of us are Orthodox. And I think, I'm not sure that this is true, but I think that orthodoxy may, uh, which is a, actually a broad plane of activity, nevertheless is probably too restrictive for the new age that we are in now. 
that we need some of that uh, Gnostic energy that was snuffed out by the Orthodox people. Now, this is heresy, of course, and uh, heresy just means, you know, you're going a different direction from, um, I mean, heresy just means literally you're going 180 degrees uh, from where you're supposed to go. But I'm not really trying, I'm just suggesting that we are at a, an incredible moment in the history of the community. We have, we're at the end of the sort of Reformation period where for 500 years we have been dealing with the sort of the, the conflict between uh, Catholicism and uh, Protestantism. That's pretty much over in most people's minds. But the new world, the digital world, is a whole different thing. And the church is going to adapt to that. And I think it's going to adapt to that through um, uh, something beyond what orthodoxy can provide us with. Now, that's just my guess. I am not a prophet, so I could be wrong, and uh, the, you know, I might be taken out by the bishop and executed for, for that opinion. But uh, I'm just saying we live in a, a very uh, interesting time. Now, um, I did when I heard that uh, um, the president was going to get rid of TikTok. I naturally had to go out and get the app, and. Uh, and look at it. And my, my daughter is quite right about it. It is basically uh, a time suck. You just, you're watching uh, people who make like one minute videos of whatever they want to. And they sort of fall into four categories. I'll just summarize this for you because this is the world that the gospel must speak to, um, at least sort of. Uh, there's a whole group of dancers. These are young people, mostly boys, young boys, about 15 to 18 maybe, um, and, they, um, and they dance. That they're girls too that dance. They do a kind of shuffle dance that, uh, and the, there is like two or three different uh, musical renditions of this. Um, there are people who are doing athletics, calisthenics or whatnot. They, there are some who are doing how-to. This is how you get great abs. This is how you get great legs, that sort of thing. Um, the, the, the third group is a group of, all I can say is comedians who are trying to get in there. Now, all of these kids are really... Um, in the peak of health, then they are absolutely very attractive. And then you have a comedian who is older and not so attractive, and it's a tough audience. I mean, you're going to have to work hard to, to get that to work. Um, and then the, there's a fourth group that's more heterogeneous. Um, there is a, a group of people who are outing themselves uh, out, of, out of the closet as uh, LGBTQ people. Um, well, you can spend a lot of time watching it and it, it's exuberant and youthful and, um, and narcissistic. And I decided that the president is banning it because it's a real competition for him. Uh, there is no way he can go back and be 15 and, uh, and command our attention as 15 year olds can. Um, but this is the world we're in now. I mean, this is sort of high school writ large. It's, you know, remember all those status things that happened in high school? That's all going on on TikTok. Some of it's pretty incredible. I mean, the, the, the calisthenics or the gymnastics is, um, and of course they have slow motion and they have all kinds of things that happen. Um, but I, I, I don't recommend you get the app because it is definitely a waste of time. And it's in the best sense of the word. 
but it is also the world we live in now, the world that our young people live in, and the church is going to have to respond to that. And there is, there are a couple of religious people. There's a Roman priest who has a little shtick that he does, and he tries to do the shuffle dance, but he doesn't quite make it. Um, but he's at least trying to get the word to the people. That's what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to get the word to the people, and we're going to have to figure out how to do that. And we may find that um, the Arians might be more useful to us than, than the Orthodox. But all I'm saying is, is this question, who do you say that, people, that Jesus is, who do you say that Jesus is? It goes on and on. We have to, we have to decide all the time with each new, um, new thing. The, uh, the Protestants decided that Jesus was somebody different than, than the Roman Catholics. Um, and that gave us, among other things, the Thirty Years' War. Um, but the point I'm just trying to make is, is that the church was making this decision just like we each have to make that decision. I always thought of it as an individual choice, but it wasn't. It's also the church community itself has to decide, just as we have decided to have communion in this time of pandemic, um, and I'm very grateful for your presence so that we can do that. Um, well, I've had my comment. Uh, kind of a smorgasbord, I know, but um, maybe you have, maybe this has stirred up something for you that you might, would, yeah. Michael. Oh, I, I sure don't have anything to add to that, but I just, I just want to give thanks to you and so the spirit that moves you for reminding us that we don't have anything to fear from scholarship, that studying the sources of our, the sources that we draw on from right. our faith, that studying them does not shatter our faith. Uh, no. That may sound like a... a it actually course. makes it... Uh, yeah, that may sound like a, a duh, but it's not a duh in this culture, and, and we're challenged sometimes for our curiosity when it comes to faith. Thank you for reminding us that there's nothing to fear from yeah, I, and I, you know, as I say, the, the, the exigencies of governing made the early church at, in the fourth century worried about what exactly this meant. But we don't govern anymore. We are, um, we are to, meant to be persuasive, not governing. Um, and and that's a really interesting and powerful thing. Um, I always thought about this in terms of stewardship. You know, in in England and in Germany, and they have established, um, they take in taxes and they distribute them to the church communities. Um, and what what means is that, that their their communities are not very responsive to what's going on in the culture uh, because they have a ready set of income. Whereas here in the United States, we have to um, we have to beg <laughs> for money <laughs> to run the church, and that's good because it means that the culture itself has a way of of talking to the church about what needs to happen. And uh, I think that, I hope you can see where I'm going with that, but it's, it's just a, it's, it's a way where the, the church is influenced by the outside. And I think we're much more powerful in being a spiritual influence than in being a governing influence. I mean, I think it's important that government work, but I don't think I, I think theocracies are a really bad idea. Um, they just are. Um, and uh, we can see that in Iran with the, the uh, Islam.
Islamic uh, theocracy. It just it just doesn't work because the the concerns about God are different than the concerns about making sure that the group responds well to pandemic or to threat from outside or whatever is going on governmentally. We can influence, we can suggest, um, we can grumble, we can do whatever we need to do, but I think we're more powerful and more uh, faithful to our mission in the persuasive element than in the governing element. Now, orthodoxy came in and became central to understanding who Jesus was in that moment when the church joined the government of, of Rome. Uh, but we're just not there anymore. We have a whole different thing to do. Well, thank you. Gives me a chance to dust off some of my historical stuff that I like to, to go to. But, I mean, you and I have a choice. Who is Jesus? And the church has made those choices, um, but maybe, you know, we have to make them too. And I think, and this is my last little bit, um, I think most of us, most of the time, are agnostics because we're not in real uh, danger from something, and so we are not real engaged about our need for God. Um, we might be in touch with God, we might be prayerful, we might be connected to God in very strong ways, but it's not until we really need God that we dust off the, brush aside our sort of atheistic, not atheistic, agnostic tendencies and commit ourselves to who Jesus is. Um, now, that's how it works for me. You can, you know, you can argue with me about that. Uh, there are people who have a, a gift for prayer, for instance, and, and God is right there for them um, all the time. I just don't happen to be one of those people. Um, anyway, well, thank you for listening. Let's, let's stand and reaffirm our faith in the Nicene Creed. in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one in being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary, and he was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now, the place where they were arguing about in this, where eternally begotten of the Father, that Jesus was begotten of the Father, that means that the Father existed first and then created Jesus after that. 
one true God, true God, begotten, not made, one being with the Father, one substance with the Father. These were the big arguments of the Nicene Council right there. Well, enough of that. Um, prayers of the people that you would ask. Uh, yeah. Sure. Which form do you want? You want six? Three down to three. Yes. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. No, I'm sorry. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work. For our families, friends, and neighbors. And for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of our creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For our president, presiding bishop and our bishops and for all bishops. For all who serve, serve God, God in his church. church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation. For Patricia, Sherry, Ashley, Mark, Hazel, Debbie, Larry, Denise, Lynn, Ma Mike, Judy, Lori, Kristen, Chris, Haley, Carla, Robert, Jimmy, Kathy, Carol, Corky, Sherry, Tom, Bob, Glenda, and Steve, Shelley. For Taryn Jenkins and her family, Vince and Katie. Hear us, Lord. For your mercy, is, mercy great. is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. Well, but this has been a wonderfully cool uh, August yes. for us. And uh, I'm sure it is in rain, but. been a blessing. We will exalt you, O God, our King. And praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Especially remember Dustin and Shirley. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Who put their trust in you. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Peace. Okay. All right. Um, uh, now.
announcements? Do we have any? Well, the only one I have is I will be uh, house sitting for some people starting Wednesday, Wednesday to Wednesday. That will affect nothing. I still have my phone, and uh, uh, but I will be a little bit in different circumstances. So, a uh, well, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave Himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. Eucharistic Prayer A on page 361 in the prayer book. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power, power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we've fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, 
sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, the perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ, Christ is, is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will come again. again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and an ending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity constancy and peace and at the last day bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom all this we ask through your son jesus christ by him and with him and in him in the unity of the holy spirit all honor and glory is yours almighty father now and forever amen amen And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, our Father who art in heaven, 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 hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come, thy will, will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive, forgive those who trespass, trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia! The gifts of God for the people of God. Father, 
You have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace, and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.